Well, here we are back again. It's I know it's been really too long since I uh, recorded another session on that engineering project that I'm doing with three robots, uh, Fanex, Scare robots, a Compact Logix uh, controller, and some AMCI stepper motors and some other doodads, gadgets. And this time we're going to go from the electrical design into the programming. So let's jump right into this and start discussing first the structure of the program, how I normally would structure a program to make it easy to maintain. My thoughts are always with the maintenance folks whenever I write a program. If I was the maintenance person, how would I want the program to look to make it easy to troubleshoot considering that it may be months between visits out to this particular machine. It just needs to be really clear and concise like a well-written novel. Let's do it. We're going to begin with the project opened in Studio 5000 or if you like Logix Designer. This is not a course or discussion on RS Logix Studio 5000 or Logix Designer. However, I would like to mention that there's not much difference between RS Logix 5000, Studio 5000, and Logix Designer. Just a, just a brief review of, and there was something before that too, in the RS Logix 5000 era, there was the straight up RS Logix 5000, then there was Enterprise, but we won't go back that far. The real difference between those three, RS Logix 5000, Studio 5000, and Logix Designer, is the era or the time frame when they were released and minor changes in the format. When we go to look at the Logix and Logix Designer, it's going to look 99.99% identical to the same Logix in RS Logix 5000 version anything. Release 20 is the latest of the older, uh, we'll call it RS Logix 5000. Then came Studio, and that would be released 21 through, I don't know, 20-something. And then there was Logix Designer. The only difference between Studio and Designer is that they added the PanelView 5000 under that umbrella to allow you to do your HMI and your controller programming and development all in one environment. Other than that, if you're using Studio 5000 or Logix 5000, Logix Designer, this is all relevant. Now, the graphical user interface has a different appearance as we go into later and later revisions, but it's, it's more uh, aesthetics, not functional. What I have open here is version 33 of Logix Designer. What separates it from earlier versions would be down at the bottom of your controller organizer. You see you have controller organizer and you have logical organizer. The logical organizer is a new feature that was added in the last couple years to allow you a clear, clean view of just the logic. Where when we look at the logic organizer, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there that you don't need to look at when you're doing your programming, like the I.O. configuration, motion groups. If you don't have any motion groups, then you definitely don't need to be looking in there. So really what they did was they took the task, whatever number there are, and the programs in the task, and that's your logical organizer. What I'm not sure I like is if you go to logical model, Notice it put these, puts these all in alphabetical order, whereas in the controller organizer, they are in the order that I put them in there, in order of execution. Now, is it going to make a big difference what order these get executed in? It shouldn't. If you wrote your program correctly, it should not make any difference whatsoever. That's the only thing I don't like about the logical analyzer, is it puts them in alphabetical order. Let's close up our main task. Actually, we'll just close the task. The very first thing that you do, besides pick the controller, so if you opened up the controller properties, you'd see that this is a 1769L27ERM. That means Ethernet redundant with motion. And the QBFC1B is a controller. It's not a processor. 
Uh, a controller has I.O., a processor does not. A processor plugs into a chassis or connects into a system of backplane that then picks up I.O. modules on that backplane. Whereas a controller, this particular one, has all of that built into the plastic box. The I.O. modules, four of them, input, output, high-speed counter, and analog input and output are all built into one plastic box. Now, I'm not going to go into any of this, these other tabs simply because that's not the subject. So I'm going to cancel that. What we're mainly interested in is how I organized or how you might organize your project. The very first thing you need to do after you pick your controller, pick the revision that you're going to work with, and I will remind you of this. There are certain modules that have firmware levels that must be the same as the controller's firmware level. Specifically, certain motion modules. If you're going to use a motion module, its firmware is 31 and you're using 33 for your program, you're going to have to flash that module up to 33, they must match. But in this project, we're not dealing with any of that convolution. So back to our discussion. The first thing you're gonna do is IO configuration. That is the very first thing that I do whenever I create a project, I define my IO configuration because this is all external to your controller. Now this is internal, this is embedded IO. So I've got uh, embedded discrete IO embedded analog IO and there's two modules in there they're embedded discrete that's the IQ 16 and the OB 16 so you could take a processor and a chassis and put these exact same modules in there and it would look the same except in the IO tree here so here we're seeing that we have a L27 ERM QB FC 1B and the embedded IO is encompassed right here. So when you defined your project with this processor, this was all a given. And you can add expansion IO to that uh, fixed IO brick or to that plastic box on the end of it. It needs a, a termination end cap. And if you wanna add more IO modules, you just slide off that end cap. Well, first you disengage the connector, slide it off, slide on your additional analog and discrete any kind of module and then put the end cap back on. Of course, after you uh, slide the end cap back on, then you do have to push the connector back in. That's a given. However, we're not using any extended or expansion IO, so that's why nothing shows up here. Now keep in mind that this project is already in a semi-functional state, meaning that the electrical system is built, tested, the I.O. is checked out, and uh, we have been operating it, but not in full capacity, not in production. Because the tooling changed for the parts that the robots assemble, which means the, it has to be retooled. The end of arm tooling and the nests have to be retooled. However, the I.O. is not going to change. Uh, the program will change a little bit because the program wasn't really finished. But the basic structure is there. That will not change. So let's look at our I.O. First, we have our processor. And these are, up here's the processor right here. <clears throat> the processor is plugged into the bus. Okay, and then you go across the bus to the embedded I.O. or expanded. Also, this processor has built into it a uh, redundant ethernet which means it has two rj45 connectors on the front edge underneath where you can't see them so you can um, daisy chain <clears throat> ethernet between ethernet devices also on ethernet thereby connected to the processor this little piece of text here that is not the controller. This is it up here. This is the controller up here, not down here. That's a placeholder to show you in relationship to these other devices what these other devices have access to. 
So this is not the processor. You don't right click on this and then open it up. So you could go to properties and it'll open it up, but it's not really the processor. This is the processor up here. And when you're doing certain things online, you will notice that this down here, this placeholder does not give you necessarily all of the access that this does up here. See, this says it's in slot zero. This doesn't have a slot number. It just shows it's on ethernet. Okay, so we've got, we'll just do these in order. We've got two AMCI uh, stepper motors and they have, you know, an, an ethernet, they have a dual ethernet interface. So there's two connectors on each of these stepper motors for ethernet. And these stepper motors are really a combination stepper motor, driver, and controller. So it's three basic elements or devices connected into one package. And then on the back of it, it has a connector for power, a connector for IO, external IO, and then it has two ethernet connect. Time permitting, not today, but at some later date, I may uh, create a video to show you how to add those two or to add N AMCI uh, E2 type stepper motor into your project. It's a little more involved than just adding an IO module. There are EDS files that you need to add to your library and a few other hoops to jump through, so to speak. <clears throat> the next item is a armor block, 1732E, IB16M12DRA. And um, that's a little simpler to add because that is a native product to Rockwell Automation. That's a Rockwell Automation Allen Bradley <clears throat> armor block. And there is a Ethernet address associated with this. And at some later date, uh, we'll try to do a project where I show you how to add that. Now, all these little Ethernet things that you add, for the most part, they can be added with Boot P, which is Allen Bradley or Rockwell Automation's version of DHCP, Data Handling Control Protocol. And the armor blocks have dip switches or little rotary switches for you to set something. Typically, it's to set the last couple numbers of the Ethernet address. But for right now, we'll just leave that alone. And then we needed to add the EX600, which is a SMC. It's um, a valve body. In other words, it has a manifold with valves on it solenoid valves, and then it also has input modules, output modules, and it has an Ethernet interface. That has to be added, and that was probably the most complex of all the Ethernet devices is getting that set up properly and added. Then there is the 440C CR30, which is the programmable safety relay, or programmable, you could call it a programmable safety controller, because it's actually an LC30, a micro 800 LC30 in red plastic. That has to be added. That needs EDS files. And then we, for the conveyor, we have a PowerFlex 525. And that has to be added. That's pretty straightforward, adding the VFD. Then you have to add each of the three robots. That's a little bit more involved. So I would say that adding the robots simply because access to the appropriate information and procedures from FANUC is much more difficult to come by than say the AMCI. So the FANUC would have been the most difficult than the AMCI. Actually, I might put the EX600 as the second most difficult than the AMCI, those SMD E2s. And then of course the Rockwell 1732, that's native, so that plugs in pretty simple as well as the drive and the 440C uh, programmable safety relay. My want is to just keep recording until I'm done with a subject matter, no matter how long it is. However, uh, many people have complained that you need to break it up into smaller increments. Now, to me, 
you watch until you're tired of watching, you're bored, and then you stop, and then you come back to that point and start again. But we're going to break her up. So uh, we'll be back exactly where we left off in the next video. Thank you.